at the Outsiders Conf Conference in uh, Utah about a month ago. And the talk that she'll be giving, I can pretty much promise you, is something you'll come away from with a lot of insight and knowledge. Talk that she'll be giving, I can pretty much promise you. Oh, I have to mute my. Uh, come away from hold on. With a lot like of I said, I always forget something while I'm there. There we go. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so we're not officially started yet. Uh, we'll start right at the top of the hour. Um, I am going to ask everyone that's in in, um, in the Zoom meeting to please keep your microphones and your cameras off. That increases bandwidth and makes for a much smoother presentation. Uh, we have chats on the uh, Zoom. We have them on YouTube and we have them on Facebook. And I will be happy to try and answer any questions about that. and. If there's, it's a question that I need to ask Sapna, I'll either hold it till the end of the uh, presentation, or if it's something that I feel I need to um, interrupt her and ask her right at that time, I will do that. So as everyone is gathering in and as we're getting to the top of the hour on the chat, please uh, let us know where you're coming from and you're signing in from, I should say. and. Uh, I'm going to, we are at five o'clock, so I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with uh, telling you about how we uh, always during these uh, webinars, we'll always have a special program, a special deal to celebrate our presenter. And what it is, is that we are giving a uh, code so that you can get 15% off of anything uh, that we sell on the NISI website. This code is live 15 SAPNA. It expires April 30th, and it's for anything that is in the NISI range. We also have a new brand. We have a brand called Explorer, and Explorer is a range of tripods uh, and ball heads and other types of gear for the outdoor photographer. Uh, they're relatively new to the United States, but they are phenomenal. They are built to incredibly good specifications and designed to be the maximum amount of uh, performance with the minimum amount of weight and size so that they're very easy to carry around. And um, I think this is maybe the first or the second time we've ever offered a uh, discount on Explorer. So please check out the brand. Um, you can find it, uh, you can find us online. You can find us, uh, the Nisi website has links to the Explorer website as, the, as does the Explorer back to the Nisi. The, the coupon code is the same and it's got the same expiration date. So I, oh, look at that from Hong Kong. Hello there. So that's, um, that's almost as far as uh, the host of this, the uh, presentation. We've got Andrew, the director of uh, NISI and Explorer, uh, who's actually operating the uh, technical side of things from Sydney, but Hong Kong, that's pretty cool. So before I get started with Sapna, I just wanna mention that in a couple of days, we are gonna have a uh, webinar of a very different subject. It's going to be on the uh, world of macro photography and Mike Motes, who is an accomplished and published photographer on macro photography, will be discussing how to take pictures of very teeny tiny little things. And um, I believe there'll actually even be a live demonstration of his setup and how he works. And you'll actually see that. So. Uh, with no further delay, I want to introduce you to Sapna Reddy. Should I say Dr. Sapna Reddy or? Sapna is fine. <laughs> Sapna is Sapna Reddy, a absolutely fabulous photographer who we've known of for, a, for quite a long time, uh, but I actually only got to really meet her face to face uh, last month. And um, I'm very happy to have a new friend. She's wonderful. 
So Sapna, I'm gonna uh, stop sharing our screen, let you uh, say hello to everyone and then get your screen fired up and the floor is yours, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, I wanna shout out a big thanks to Nissi for making this webinar possible. Um, it's always tough to give a presentation when I cannot see my audience because um, I have no way of knowing how this talk is being received. So please feel free to drop your comments into the chat and uh, Jim will keep feeding me your questions. So we'll try to keep this as interactive as possible. And I'm I like to, to keep feeding me your questions. So we'll try to keep oh, this as no, 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 interactive sorry. as possible. Go ahead. And I like to keep feeding me your questions. So we'll try to- You're all good, so sorry. Ah, uh, no worries. My mistake again. <laughs> So um, just want to make this as interactive uh, as possible. So my voice droning on interminably is not going to put anyone to sleep. We don't want any lullabies. So I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Jump into the presentation here. Okay. How's that? Looking good? Jim, are you there? Yes, yeah, that's it good. is good. Okay, everything okay with the slide? Are you there? Like it? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. Okay. Everything okay with the slide? Oh. Let's hope I don't echo anymore. So basically, um, this this is a whole mouthful of words, the art of effective communication for photography. But today I wanted to take some time and talk to you about how do we communicate through our pictures? And um, you know, how do we go from experience? to expression. Uh, this is a very informal presentation. For those of you who have attended the Outsiders this year, you will have seen this presentation. Um, so I'm resharing it on the NISI platform. And feel free to interrupt me, like I said earlier. And we'll go at a slower pace than we did at the Outsiders and try to delve in a little bit deeper into the concepts that I talked about. Mm -hmm. I want to. Okay. So, a little bit about myself. Um, so Jim briefly mentioned uh, about me. I am actually pursuing a dual career right now. I work as a radiologist uh, three days of the week, and then the rest of the time is uh, devoted to photography. So I treat both careers with equal passion. Um, so it's photography is no longer a hobby. And um, I really enjoy that mix. So in radiology, what I do is basically analyze images in an attempt to achieve cure. Uh, so it's like you're solving visual puzzles and radiology is done in a confined space, in a dark room, and there isn't really much human to human interaction going on. You're just looking at cases on a screen and you know rendering the reports to it. So it's very uh, disciplined, visual analysis of images. Before you, you have to be very thorough, you have to be very accurate and reproducible, which means you have to read a CT scan or an MRI exactly the same way as any other radiologist who's well-trained would do. So there is no room for originality or creativity um, or you know, putting your own twist on it or anything of that sort. Um, and on the other hand, when I pursue photography, uh, the main purpose of my photography is basically to create images that hopefully help to calm the mind to suit people, uh, the viewer, as well as myself. And so there I'm in wide open expanses. You know, uh, the world is filled with color in contrast to the grayscale that I see in radiology. And what is encouraged and celebrated is actually originality and creativity and thinking outside the box and fine tuning your individual style. So you really wanna do something that's original, not confined to any rules. So that um, mix, uh, which involves visual analysis in both fields, but so different in terms of the end result I'm striving for is what really makes it a very interesting um, career choice and life for me. I find balance in it. I feel myself very grounded. Um, you know, when I feel stressed in radiology, I jump into photography and it calms me. And then if I feel that the physical stress of photography, being out there in the field is getting to be a bit much, then I jump back into radiology and sitting in a plush chair in a very 
comfortable office reading images. So it's a very good balance. And I think I'll continue with that um, for a few more years and maybe transition to a full-time photographer after a few years. Um, I would just like to give a shout out to Missy once again for making this uh, webinar possible. Um, I started my collaboration with Missy recently. I had the good fortune of meeting Jim at the Outsiders Conference and um, I started using the Missy filters a few uh, months back, really liked them. So when Jim approached me and uh, asked if I would like to be a brand ambassador, I thought it was a huge honor to be considered and of course took them up. I'm also supported by these other companies you see here. I'm a Sony Alpha ambassador. I'm an optic creator for B&H, a brand ambassador for Duodere. And I'm also supported by the heat company Flipper and Pangea. Pangea is a small company that makes, it's a startup that's making rain jackets out of recycled um, materials. So I, I like to throw uh, my um, name behind brands that I really trust, brands uh, which supply me with gear that I actually use. And if I find that the gear is not up to my expectations, then I basically don't support that brand anymore. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we hope to achieve today. And we're talking about ex uh, the experience of being out there in nature. This is Mount Tamalpais. It is a local favorite spot for photographers in the Bay Area. And you can see why, because we get that famous San Francisco fog flowing in. And as it kisses the um, uh, base of the mountains, it creates this ethereal dreamy feeling. Here uh, in the bottom uh, right, you can see those two tiny photographers, and that will probably give you an idea of the scale and the grandeur of the scene. So when we are standing at a spot like this, we have all our senses invested in what is before us, right? So our sight, sound, smell, everything is invested in it, and we are having a 3D experience. However, when we take the picture and we're trying to reproduce that experience for a viewer, we basically have condensed it to one sense, and that is the visual. But that's a daunting task because you're saying, let's take an experience which was 3D with all five senses, let's condense it to a 2D flat plate, which only a viewer can see, and then say, I'm going to make you feel everything I felt when I was standing in the field. That, that's a huge challenge. How, how do we do that? Um, how do we tell the stories we want to tell through our pictures? I want to tell you a little bit about this place. This is again Mount Tamalpais. And this is a picture taken by my friend Tanmay Satpal. I show this image because I want to stress upon you the difference between just taking a snapshot, you know, like documenting something that's already there versus what I and many of my peers aspire to do, which is fine art photography. The difference is that in fine art photography, you have a creative vision. You're not just taking what's in front of you, but you're trying to use your creative vision to create a unique image that has not only your creative vision, but you infuse it with your personality, make it your own an image that perhaps no one else can create even if they stand right there. That's the difference. How did Tanmay do that? Do, do that here. Basically, show, he knows that the fog rolls in Mount Tam. He knows that you know, during periods of angled light, you can do prolonged exposures and therefore create a dreamy ethereal fog flow kind of a picture. But in addition to that, Tanmay knew that the comet Neowise was going to show up in the sky it would line up perfectly if he stood at this point. So he showed up multiple days trying to capture the picture that he had in his mind. And finally, one magical evening, he was able to do it. This is the photo that won the best photo award in the International Landscape Photographer of the Year competition for this year. Let me um, try to close this. Um, so basically, you can see the comet there, 
and you can see the fog flow below, right? It's a beautiful image. But this is actually a time blend. So if one, see, a person had to think about it, plan for it, and then execute it. It's not a snapshot, right? So he had to get there ahead of time, set up, do the fog flow pictures during periods of sunset, then wait for the sky to get dark. And then when the comet showed up, he did another exposure specifically for the sky and then blended the two together. This image is very strongly emotionally compelling. The reason being that it tells a visual story, right? It tells you what the comet looked like in the sky, but it also shows you what the landscape was below. So when you put a story together, it becomes a much more compelling image. We actually have been communicating through visuals long before we developed the alphabet, long before we developed the spoken language. We basically were telling stories through pictures. On the left-hand side is an image uh, that is a cave uh, drawing from 50,000 years ago. Can you believe that? 50,000 years ago. Somebody who lived 50,000 years ago drew this image, and today when we look at it, we can understand that they're trying to tell us the story of a procession, a procession that involved people, it involved animals, perhaps there was some dancing going on, and then, of course, when color could be incorporated into the images, they become even more emotionally compelling. So the language of photography is universal because we communicate through visuals, and it's something we have done since time immemorial. So why is it that a picture is worth a thousand words? Did you know that 50% of our neural tissue is directly or indirectly related to vision? Usually I throw this question out to the crowd before I, I show this slide, but of course, because I, can, I cannot hear you speak or shout out your answers, I have to say the question and the answer myself. Um, so anyway, that's, that's a lot of neural tissue dedicated to just vision, right? So amongst all of the senses that we have, to take in the stimuli that are around us, vision happens to be one of the most important. And a human brain can process an entire image seen within 13 milliseconds. Think about that. How many words could you possibly articulate in 13 milliseconds? What, what, could, what could you probably say that would get a story across? But if you show someone an image, they can literally get the entire story in 13 milliseconds. And it takes us half a second to respond to visual stimuli. So as photographers, we have at our fingertips one of the most powerful modes of communication, which are our pictures. Here's an example for you. If, if I wanted to tell you the story behind this image, it would take a while, isn't it? I could probably fill in the details about the name of the dog and you know its habit to chew up shoes and how we have to store them up high. And but that would take a lot of time. But anyone looking at this image knows, knows right off the bat what the story is about. In just a few seconds, you have grasped the entire story. Ansel Adams once said that a great photograph is one that fully expresses what one feels in the deepest sense about what is being photographed. You know, I, I feel that every single one of us who picks up a camera is really trying to express ourselves through photographs. You know, others may disagree and say only certain people indulge in expressive photography while others don't. Completely disagree with that. I think the reason we create art is because we are trying to communicate with our audience. So it becomes a personal expression of our creative vision. So I said, photography is a universal language. I think all of you would agree, right? Because through pictures, we could communicate with anyone in any part of the world. 
with any culture, any language, any background, right? You show them a picture and they will have an emotional response to it. So if photography is a universal language, let's jump in and see how we can master this language, right? Because if we master this language, then we master how we are able to communicate with our audience using our pictures. Let's start at the very beginning. In order to learn any language, the first and foremost thing we have to do is basically learn the alphabet. The analogy to that for photography would be understanding how to use your camera, your lenses, your gear, your filters, tripods, what have you. That is the very basic fundamental step to learning the language of photography. If we don't master how to use our gear, then that means we haven't even learned the alphabet and there's no chance of us ever being proficient in um, being visually literate or being able to communicate visually to our images. Okay, so we learned how to use our camera, we learned how to use our gear, we've done with the alphabet, let's go on to the next step, which would be syllables. Again, it's the fundamentals of photography, which would be learning how the exposure triangle works, how do you focus? Where do you focus? What is, what is the concept of depth of field? You know, the basic concepts that are needed before we can make pictures. So that's our syllables. Okay, so we learned the alphabet. We learned how to make our syllables. What would the next logical step be? I know what you all are thinking. Words, right? We have to develop a vocabulary in order for us to be able to communicate with the audience. Well, in photography, words are actually the focal points, the visual elements that we incorporate into our frame. You might say, well, how am I going to find the words or the visual elements? Let me give you an example. Like, say you, you go to a gathering, right? And you're standing there and you're feeling very awkward. You're not connecting to anybody who's present there and you're not finding the words to express yourself. The equivalent of that in photography would be if you went to a scene, a landscape, you stood there and you're seeing everything, but it looks like it's in harsh light. You're not establishing an emotional connection to anything in the scene before you. And you're like, I don't really know what this picture is about. I don't know what to frame, what to shoot. What is the story about? So basically, you're struggling to find the words to express yourself, which means you're struggling to find the visual elements that should be used to create the image. But fortunately for us, there is a way to get past this. All through evolution, our eyes have been trained to recognize certain things when we look at something. What are those visual elements? Brightness, color, contrast, texture. And in addition, we are also drawn to human element, the human subject in the frame. If we know this, then we can use these elements to identify what the focal points are. How are we going to do that? Let's start with the first one, brightness. If I asked you, to close your eyes and open them and then look at this image and tell me where your eyes travel to, I guarantee you they will go to the point of brightness and contrast where the trees are being silhouetted against the light and the clouds. This is an image that was taken in San Francisco. So you'll see the trees and the contrast first and then maybe your eye will start traveling around to say, oh, I see the incoming wave, there is an ocean there, this is about the ocean. Or you'll start to see the low-lying clouds which are you know, um, spreading themselves between the hills and the trees. But once you know this, once you realize that a person is drawn to brightness and to contrast, you can capitalize on that when you're trying to create an emotionally compelling image because you're gonna say, I'm going to decide where I'm gonna put points of brightness and contrast to draw the viewer's eye in. That's the concept. When I arrived at this scene, this is in Colorado, when I arrived in this, uh, at this place initially, 
the light was very harsh. You know, the whole scene was filled with very harsh light. And I just stood there and I was like, I really don't know what I'm going to shoot here. It's right, it's colorful, but I don't quite know how to create a visual pathway for this image. And then the storm clouds rolled in, the sun started setting, so the angle of light came in, and all of a sudden, it became clear to me what I was supposed to be photographing, right? I'm looking at the point of brightness, and I'm looking at the point of maximal color, and this beautiful triangle of full autumn foliage at the base of the mountain becomes the center stage for my image. Why is it important to recognize what are the things the human eye is drawn to? Because if we become aware that, hey, I should be looking for brightness, color, contrast, and texture, it opens your eyes for the possibility of creating additional images. What do I mean by that? So basically, while I was shooting this image, there was another one that popped up. It's this image. Because I'm paying attention to where we have luminosity, where we have color, and where we have contrast, I can pick out more images from the scene before me, more images that will connect better with the audience. And I wanted to throw in this uh, point about the human element. It's a very strong focal point. So when you incorporate it into a frame, be aware of the fact that you would draw the viewer side towards it. And in this particular instance, I think it uh, functions as a very good anchor for this scene. Okay, so we said we learned the alphabet, we learned the syllables, and we learned the words. The next point would be to create sentences, right? Once we have words, we have to create sentences. Think of sentences as the composition. Because what are sentences? They are the arrangement of words, isn't it? So if you take your visual elements, which you're treating as your words, and you arrange them in your frame, that's composition. Composition is nothing but the ability to create order, balance, and harmony from chaos. There are certain concepts we need to keep in mind when we're talking about composition. The first and foremost that I would like to introduce is that of balance. Balance to a composition is analogous to arranging words in the proper order. Right? So when you have a collection of words and you're trying to create a sentence, you would keep the words in a certain order to make sure the sentence makes sense. By the same token, when we take our visual elements or focal points and we're trying to arrange them in the scene, finding balance or what we call weight distribution is key to having a meaningful image. If we don't have balance in the composition, then it's basically like we threw jumbled words into a sentence and it makes no sense whatsoever. Let's analyze that a little bit more. So take a look at this image. So right off the bat, now you guys are all um, well-versed in your vocabulary because you know how to find the focal points. So when you look at this, you go, aha, I realize that the tree is a good focal point because it is an area of sharp contrast. And then you look at the light on the mountain and you say, aha, that's an interesting focal point as well. So this is a story about the tree and light on the mountain and the reflections. Now it's my job to arrange them in such a way that there is balance through the frame. Some of you probably look at this composition, already analyzed it and said, I know what you did here. You used the rule of thirds. Yes, you're right, to a certain degree, I did. We love the rule of thirds, don't we? Because when we're just starting out composing an image, it's nice to have some sort of a guideline some sort of a guideline to know where should I put my focal point so that it makes sense. So here, the tree was placed in the bottom left and we put the mountain with the light and the reflections on the top right. The rule of thirds is good for somebody who's just starting out to compose images, but it really doesn't work beyond that point. You, you need to rise beyond that point. And I'll, I'll tell you why. When you look at this, 
you could argue that the light on the mountain and the reflections are not really confined to one point. They're actually spreading across multiple squares or rectangles there, isn't it? So this is not a real constricted rule of thirds that we're using. It's just an arbitrary thing. What is more important to understand is what we call the Baroque diagonal. What is that? Most of us, when we read, we go from left to right. For an image, we go from bottom to top. I think Urdu is the only language, you know, Arabic language. Um, languages tend to read from right to left, but majority of us will be, read from left to right and the image, like I said, from bottom to top. So anything that is arranged along this diagonal line, which goes from the bottom left to the top right, results in a more aesthetic arrangement. It's just that we have trained our minds to perceive information a certain way, so that when we see an image with focal points arranged along the diagonal line, it ends up being a more pleasing or more aesthetic image for us. What I would encourage you to do when you compose is to not just use the Baroque diagonal, but to actually start breaking down the image into subdivisions. What people sometimes fail to understand is that what you exclude from the composition is as important as what you include. So basically, every pixel in your frame is extremely valuable real estate. So we have to be kind of very stingy and conscientious about what we include in our frame. And one way to analyze and make sure that we're doing it right is basically to divide it into these smaller divisions and ask yourself, is every part of my frame contributing to the overall visual story? Okay. Let's look at another example here. So this is uh, the Nepali coast in Kauai, Hawaii. And once again, you are very quickly identifying what the focal points are because you know color is a strong focal point. So your eyes are going to go to the mountains. I'm going to say that green color is popping. It'll go to the ocean because the blue color is popping over there. It'll go to areas of luminosity, right? So you'll see the clouds in the mountains and you'll see the clouds over the ocean, the incoming wave. These are all points that are going to speak to you and you'll say, this is what the story is about. Now, this is again arranged along the Baroque diagonal. You notice how balance is being achieved between the visual elements in this frame. You would look at it and go, that's a good image, intuitively, but may not realize why is it a good image. So every time we see an image and say, that looks good to me, it's important to ask ourselves, why? Why does it feel balanced? And the more we analyze images in that fashion, the easier it becomes for us to start creating our own images with balance. So again, here at the Baroque Diagonal is how I, I um, composed the scene, but we could go beyond that and use what are called the dynamic grids. Now, before I lose anyone, I want to say that for a very, very long time, artists have used geometry in how they are going to draw or paint. So if you look at Birth of Venus by Botticelli, or you look at Salvador Dali's work, or you look at Pablo Picasso, those are not accidental, you know, on their canvas, they will actually first decide how the real estate is going to be distributed. They'll draw the geometric patterns and then start drawing or painting their subjects on the canvas. Why is that? Because that inherent geometry behind the image is key to creating a compelling image. So here I have a dynamic grid. Um, you can also call it the harmonic armature. Basically, you draw lines across the frame and then use them to divide your uh, focal points along these lines. I don't want to jump into too much about this. It's a talk entirely. I could give a one-hour talk on just the dynamic grid and the harmonic armature. That, that's not the point of this presentation. But I just want to put it out there that there is 
a mathematical analysis to why we like images, that geometry plays a very important role. And even if we are putting it in the back of our mind and saying, I'm going to achieve balance by breaking down the composition into different parts and making sure that every part has balance within it, that's just something to keep in the back of our mind. And the more we practice it, the more easier it becomes. I don't expect any of us to walk around carrying a dynamic rig, right? But just knowing that we're trying to achieve balance and then maybe when you bring it back into post-processing, if something doesn't look right, throw a dynamic grid on it and see maybe you could crop it a little bit differently. Maybe that would make it um, more aesthetic. I often um, will use a dynamic grid while I'm post-processing just to see what kind of balance I have in my image. It's something to think about. So we talked about balance, which I said is like the order of words in a sentence, right? Now we're gonna talk about the use of space. So suppose I said the sentence, I like cooking children and wild animals. It's like that. I like cooking children and wild animals. That's a very strange thing to say, isn't it? We go, what is she talking about? Is she delusional? Is she a psychopath? What's happening? But if I changed that to, I like cooking, comma, children, and wild animals, all of a sudden, I changed the meaning of the sentence completely. Punctuation, that little tiny spacing between the words made all the difference for the meaning of the sentence. Space is that important in our images. Space gives meaning. If we don't have space between our visual elements, if we don't have the right kind of separation, then we have a picture which lacks meaning. Let's take a look at an example here. I just want to put this out before we jump into the analysis of how we use space in that photography is an art of observation. It has little to do with the things you see and everything to do with the way you see them. Elliot Orbit said that. So when you look at this, we have been trained to perceive depth, right? We see certain things as being in the foreground and we see certain things as being in the background. So here, your brain will tell you there are two faces in profile or it'll tell you that there is a vase that is a single object in the background. You don't really know what's background, what's foreground, and you don't really see both pictures at the same time. Your eyes tend to jump from one to another. You'll see the faces, then you'll see the eyes, then you'll see the faces. So, so your mind starts to get confused. It's important to keep this in mind. Why? Take a look at this image. Um, I'm not sure, are they able to see the image or should I move the screen? Let me see. Let me move this here. You can see the image. Yeah, okay. All right, so here, when I say what is wrong with this image, I could also ask you what is right with this image, right? Why does it become a compelling image for us? And what we need to understand is that the relationship between the foreground and the background is being obliterated here. Much like the earlier image that I showed you, where we saw the faces and the rays kind of bunched up together. And you couldn't tell the difference. That's what we're doing here. We call this the figure to ground ratio. So basically it is the relationship of the foreground to the background. So why do I bring this up? Because even if you compose the image using a rule of thirds or the Baroque diagonal or the dynamic grid, harmonic armature, whatever you have, if we don't analyze in addition to that, the relationship of our foreground to background, then the picture will fail. So you could put uh, something that's not separated according to the rule of thirds, and if you don't have that visual separation between the foreground and background, then the image will fail. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so here, see that tiny sliver of space that I have between the incoming wave and the ice that is in the foreground, it's just almost like a line, isn't it? Very, very small space. But that's what gave it the separation from the foreground and the background. So that tiny space is 
very important. Let's take a look at, I mean, if I didn't have that, basically the picture simply wouldn't work. Let's take a look at another example. Oftentimes when I see clients shooting, they will um, basically pay a lot of attention to what they are focusing on, but forget that there is a foreground that needs to be separated from the background. So if you're shooting reflections, the angle at which you're standing, the perspective with which you're shooting is important, isn't it? Because if you got lower, then these flowers would probably obliterate the reflection. Um, so that, that's something to keep in mind when you're composing that relationship of the foreground to the background, which is called the figure to ground ratio, is a very important concept to understand and realize that space and spatial separation between the visual elements is as important as punctuation or grammar in your sentences. Okay, so we talked about balance, we talked about the use of space, and now we're gonna talk about color. I like to think about color almost as the tone with which we speak, right? For example, if I am in the field and I'm instructing clients on taking a picture and say the light is changing and something dramatic is happening, like we're getting a rainbow, Aurora Borealis dancing on a waterfall, stuff like that, then obviously we get very excited and <laughs> my voice tends to get louder and very enthusiastic and ebullient and I'm like shouting out to them, hey guys, this is it, this is the decisive moment, we gotta be capturing it now. You know, so, so you use a different kind of tone, right? Now, on the other hand, if I'm in a hospital setting and say I'm counseling a patient, then obviously the tone I use would be much more softer. Right? It would be um, soothing and you know, more calming. Why is that? Because the emotional response I want to receive is being modulated. I'm trying to energize someone out in the field when they're taking the picture, but I'm trying to calm someone when I'm addressing them in a hospital, right? So we modulate our tone and how we speak based on what kind of emotional response we want to evoke in the viewer, right? Or the person receiving that you know, communication. The same holds true in photography. So color determines what kind of tone you want to speak with. Do you want to speak louder or do you want to speak softer? Are you trying to calm someone or are you trying to excite them? Let's take a look at the color wheel. We have warm colors on one hand and then we have cool colors on the other hand, right? And warm colors tend to excite people. They tend to be very energetic, brilliant, enthusiastic, but like the louder tones and cool colors tend to be harmonious, calming, even some melancholy thrown in there, right? So you as the artist get to decide what tone you get to speak with. So you get to pick your colors and render them accordingly. Just a brief um, update about the color theory. Uh, many of you have probably been exposed to it. Many of you are probably using it in your images, but it's important if you have not been exposed to it to read up on it and understand how color theory works and how you can use colors in your composition to evoke a certain emotional response. So this is filled with warm colors, which are kind of you know more energetic, but at the same time, it feels like a soothing image, doesn't it? There is a reason for that because this is the analogous colors theory, right? What we're doing is using colors that are grouped together on the color wheel. When we do that, we tend to have a more harmonious image. Let me give you another example of that. Here's another example. Again, this feels more calming. Why is that? Because I gravitated more towards the blues, right? And there is a specific reason for that, because I wanted to create a soothing image. It's very easy to change this when you're post-processing into something that is more radical, more dramatic, but that's, that's not the emotional response I wanted to get. I wanted to get a soothing image, which is why I chose the cool colors. And then I processed in such a way that I kind of 
kept all the tones more or less similar. And you can see the result of that is a more harmonious, calming, soothing image. Important to understand this concept because it helps you modulate the tone with which you wish to express yourself through the photo photographs. Here is another example where we have opposite colors of the spectrum. So I'm combining warm with something, uh, you know, I'm combining red and green here. And you can see there at the opposite ends. And as a result, it becomes a more dramatic image. This is a complementary color scheme. So again, using color to adjust what kind of response we want. Reduce distractions. Remember I said earlier that what we exclude from the composition is as important as what we include. We cannot stress the importance of this. Normally, when we are looking at a scene before us, the human eye and brain have adapted to a point where it's very quick to analyze what's important and cut out all the stuff that is unnecessary. So even if you're surrounded you know, with, with hundreds of people and there is a lot of stuff going on, you can still focus on what's important and kind of ignore everything else, isn't it? But the camera cannot do that. So it becomes our job as photographers to do that for the camera. How do we do that? Let's say we are looking at a forest, right? We love fog in the forest. Do you know why? Because when fog flows in, a forest is an extremely complex scene. But when the fog flows in, it starts to minimize things, right? It becomes less busy. And when something is less busy, it actually becomes more pleasing to the eye. That's the reason why we want to reduce distractions. We want to be very clear what the visual story is about. Draw the viewer's eye to that and try to reduce distractions as much as possible so that the eye doesn't wander into places we don't want it to go. This is a specific example I wanted to give. Um, this is Yosemite, obviously, and you're seeing the upper and lower Yosemite Falls, and there was a beautiful um, cloud bank resting at the base of the mountains. And uh, unfortunately for me, there was a long line of cars. Um, right smack dab in the middle of the composition, which I did not want to be there, right? It's not a story about how crowded Yosemite is. It is a story of how beautiful Yosemite is. So in this particular instance, I couldn't really move to any other place because no matter where I went, those cars were not going to go away. And they're always there. And by the time I wait for them to leave, the clouds will be long gone. So here I used a content aware tool basically and eliminated the cars. I'm not saying use a content aware tool to remove distractions. I would much rather prefer to have gone somewhere where I could have eliminated seeing the cars. It wasn't possible in this particular case, but the point I'm trying to make is if the story is about something, then it's very important to ask ourselves, is there anything in the frame that detracts the eye from where I want it to go, from where the main protagonists of the story are? And if that is happening, then it's important to try to avoid that as much as possible. Okay, so we are getting along here with learning the language. We have learned the vocabulary, which were the visual elements. We have learned how to compose our sentences. And now we come to the final part of it, where we want to weave the visual story, the complete photograph, right? So if somebody says, hey, this is straight out of the camera and feels proud about it, that means they have stopped at sentence construction. They haven't really infused their creative vision into the post-processing step, which is important if you know how to weave a story. Some of us are great storytellers. Some of us are not. It's an inherent ability. But if you work at it, you could probably get better with practice. So this concept of visual pathway, where I said, you know, we have to direct the viewer's eye through the frame in order to have an emotionally compelling image is key to fine art photography. Again, it's the same principle. So it is the same principle of luminance, color, contrast, and geometry we talked about before but you're gonna now apply them to carve out a visual pathway through the frame. 
This is a picture taken by Aitip Sedin, who's my friend who lives in Turkey, and he won the International Landscape Photographer of the Year Award for this year. And this is in Cappadocia. And uh, he went there during the period of angled light and he waited for that light to hit that pathway, which forms a beautiful leading line up into the cave dwelling, which is hundreds, if not thousands of years old, which is what this story is about. So you stay invested in the frame and that vignetting around the periphery, it doesn't let you wander away, right? You have to stay in the center of the frame because everything around is dark. You're focused in the middle. Everything is deliberate here, right? There is no accident. A viewer who has not analyzed the image or who does not have the background in photography will see it and go, that's a great image, that's compelling. But as photographers, it's important we step back and ask ourselves, why? Why is it a compelling image? Why am I drawn into this? Because if we can analyze that and understand it, then we will be able to generate images which have that same strong visual pathway. Sometimes the pathway is very obvious, isn't it? For example, here, this is a no-brainer. If I'm standing at the scene, I'm like, well, that pathway is going to form a great leading line. I have fog in the background, and because it's an area of brightness, my eye is going to travel there, and I have beautiful accessory color leading the way. But did I George? the fog a little bit more in the middle? Yes, I did. Did I darken and apply a slight vignette along the periphery? Yes, I did. Did I darken the path in the foreground and brighten it in the background? Yes, I did. Why? Because I wanted to accentuate the visual pathway through the frame. Hopefully that makes sense. Here is another classic tunnel view image, right? And a lot of us have this image and we're drawn to this place because it gives us these epic scenes. Again, the fog is forming a beautiful leading line, leads, up, leads us to the waterfall and then to the mountains beyond. That bright light on the mountains in the distance is key because it's giving us something to travel to, right? And the darker foreground is basically transitioning to that brighter background, creating again a strong visual pathway. I want to talk a little bit about depth through an image. I said, when you're standing at a scene, it's a 3D experience, it's easy to understand depth then. But if you are condensing that scene to a 2D flat plate, how do we bring back that feeling of depth in an image? It's actually quite easy by understanding the concept of transitions. You see, when we are standing in the field, what is very close to us is quite sharply in focus, isn't it? What is far away is sort of softer. It's not as sharply focused. So our mind analyzes that and says, hey, what's close to you is this, which is sharply in focus. And because the thing in the distance is not sharply in focus, that is farther away. So we're engaging distance that way. We can use that to our advantage. Things that are farther tend to be hazy, softer, maybe brighter even, right? So using transitions where we go from dark to light, cool to warm, sharp to soft, desaturated to saturated, textured to smooth, basically what we're doing is creating depth through the image. So here you can see a clear cool to warm transition, right? And you can see that it's darker in the foreground and brighter in the background. And it's more textured and sharper in the foreground and it is softer in the background, all of which add to that feeling of depth. It's going to be there when you capture it to a certain degree, but understanding that it's important to convey depth and accentuating it even more makes it a more compelling image. Everything that we do in post-processing is basically enhancing what is already in our image for the most part. In each of these instances, right, you can see those transitions have been applied. In each of these instances, we love the wide angle, right? We like to get really up close where you can take tiny flowers and make them feel gigantic. So, so when we use that wide angle, though, it's important to understand that we want it to achieve that feeling of depth and then to make 
changes in post-processing that accentuate that feeling of depth. So every time you see an image which feels like it has a lot of depth, ask yourself, what are the transitions that have been applied and how are they working to, to that effect? So some of you might say, hey, it works great if you're using a wide angle. Now I know how to achieve depth in my image through a wide angle, but how am I gonna do that if I'm shooting with a long lens? Actually, the principle of transitions works well whether you use a wide angle or whether you use a zoom lens. For example, here again, the foreground, notice how it is darker, it is sharper in focus, it is more saturated than the background, and sure enough, you're conveying depth through the image, right? As long as you remember to apply those transitions, you're gonna convey that feeling of depth. Next concept I wanna talk about, now this is all where we're trying to weave our story together, right? So we added depth to our story. And now we're gonna add a 3D feeling to our story. How do we do that? This I like to call the concept of shaving the apple. So look at the image on the left-hand side. It looks like it's in very flat light, the apple doesn't really look very appealing, does it? And then you look at the right hand side and you go, that's an apple I feel like I could reach out to and take a bite out of. So why is that? They're both photographs, they're both 2D, but why is it that one feels more 3D than the other? The secret is the angled light. Notice how the light source is off to a side. It's angled in such a way that you have a part of the apple that is bright and a part of the apple that is dark. When that happens, the 3D relief jumps out at you. The shadow is adding to that feeling of the 3D relief. And of course, having the drops of uh, dew drops or drops of water on top also adds to that 3D feel. Did I accentuate things here? I sure did, right? I tried to brighten up the area that's more bright, darken the area that's more dark, dodging and burning. So key to that 3D effect feeling. And then of course, sharpen the texture on the water drops. So it jumps out at you more. But those subtle changes make all the difference. Why do we like to shoot during periods of angled light? It is specifically for this reason, because we love to have only part of our subject lit so that we can get that 3D feeling. So this is an example of an image that I took in Yosemite. This is Valley View. And I got really low because I wanted to accentuate those mounds of snow in the foreground. It's rare that we get this much snow nowadays in, in the valley, and when it happens, it's an absolute treat. But at the same time, I wanted to capture the 3D feeling for the mountain. So taking an image during a period when only one side of the mountain is lit, while the other is still relatively not lit, gives it a more 3D feeling. I hope that um, makes sense. And my point is that you will get it in the field. But if you understand that that difference between light and dark is key to conveying that 3D feeling, hopefully when you bring it into post-processing, you'll accentuate that just a little bit more so that it feels even more 3D. Take a look at this particular example. We love backlight, right? Why do we love backlight so much? So look at this scene and look at the flowers that are on the bottom left. On the bottom left, those are just looking white. Why? Because they're in the shade. And all I did was dodge them. Because they were in the shade, they have sort of a flat feeling to them. Whereas the ones that are in the middle are backlit. And that's why you feel like you can reach out and touch the petals. Right? It's important to understand that. Because then you will be looking in the field, you'll be looking for those visual elements that are being backlit. And when you bring it back into post-processing, you can work on it even more and convey that 3D feeling. And again, notice how depth is being conveyed here, right? We have something that is probably a little bit darker in the foreground, but something that's a little bit brighter in the background. And then we have sharpness in the foreground and softness in the background. It was there in the field, sure. But did I accentuate it? Yes, absolutely, because that's how we bring out that 3D feeling and feeling of depth. Okay, so we talked about adding depth to the image. We talked about light shaping, the render form, how we use dodging and burning and 
how it brings out that 3D relief. One more concept I'll talk about very quickly is that of visual tension. In this particular instance, you look at the image and you will go, aha, Sapna, I know what you did here. One of the focal points that is important here because of its color is the tree, with its foliage. Another one, because of brightness and luminosity, is the bird. Okay, so you have identified the two focal points that I'm trying to frame in this scene, the tree and the bird. Now I'm going to say I want to achieve balance through this frame. So I'm going to put them in such a way that there is equal weight distribution in the frame. Okay. But there is one other concept that we need to understand. You know how, like in prose and in poetry, it's not just the order of words or the grammar or punctuation that matters, but actual selection of the words that matters, like how the words play off of each other, right? If you're, if you're trying to compose, say, a poem, and you're trying to see if the words rhyme, how, how they work together is important, right? To have an end product that is emotionally compelling. The same holds true in an image. It's not enough for me to take two focal points, the two visual elements, arrange them in balance and hope things will work. They're working here for a specific reason. What is that? The branches are forming leading lines that go towards the bird. The bird is looking at the tree. So how is the visual pathway being established? Your eye is going to go to the tree, travel with the branches towards the bird, and look at the bird, and then the bird's beak is facing the tree, so you'll come back to the tree. So the back and forth movement between the two main visual elements is what is establishing the visual pathway in this image. For a second, imagine if the bird was looking towards the right side. What would happen? I would look at the tree, the branches would lead me to the bird, and then the bird would be looking to the right side, so my eyes would wander off the frame, wondering what the bird is looking at. If the branches were pointing to the left and the bird was looking to the right, I would have had identified the visual elements. I would have placed them with equal weight distribution, but the resulting image would be completely meaningless. Why is that? because there is no dialogue happening between the visual elements. So how each focal point or plays off of the other in your frame is also very important. And that is the concept of visual tension, right? Um, so this is pretty much coming up to the words, the end of the presentation. Just wanna say that every time you look at a photograph, Treat it as a visual story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, something where the eye has to travel to. It has to have depth to it, um, and it has to have a 3D feeling to it. And that pretty much brings us to the end of the presentation. I um, wanted to say thank you very much for your attention. You can reach out to me through my email, my website, through any of the social media platforms. I'm on Facebook, Flickr, Instagram, uh, Twitter, any, anything you wanna reach out on and uh, feel free to give me as much feedback as possible. I'm very open and very welcoming of it. And if you have any doubts that I was not able to clarify something I went over very quickly, then please reach out to me so I can answer your questions. And I did want to add one more thing. Let me see if I can... Um, um, actually wanted to go here if I can. Um, oh, looks like I stopped sharing my screen. Did I stop sharing my screen there? Yes, you did. Okay, I'm gonna share screen one more time and just jump over here to mention something quickly. Okay, do you see my screen now, Jim? Yes. Okay. So um, I just wanted to mention that I actually do workshops. Um, this is my website, basically. So you can go here and review my portfolio, um, review my images, and then basically um, check out the um, workshop selections. Most of them are sold out, but I do have openings for one that I wanted to mention, which is the Bali and Java one. It's coming up in September, and uh, it's one of the best workshops I run. And um, you get an incredible um, 
landscape to photograph. So, you know, it, it's, it's just amazing from waterfalls to volcanoes to mountains, you name it, you have it all. And uh, I like to say it's, it's one of the, my favorite for the cuisine and the fact that you can get a massage pretty much every day after your long and arduous hikes. So that's it. I think that brings me to the end of this and I'll stop sharing my screen and listen to what Jim has to say now. What do I have to say? I am um, actually, this is the uh, second time I've gotten to uh, hear this presentation and it's, it's pretty, I, we, having been a photographer for a very, very long time, um, to have someone put the whole art of photography and the whole language of photography in, in an analogous form to language, I think is something that was really, really interesting when I first saw it. And I found it just as compelling this time. I think it's a wonderful presentation. And I feel very, very lucky that Nisi, uh, you know, has been able to bring it to, now you're on YouTube. You will be on YouTube probably as of tomorrow. And hopefully uh, many of you who have watched this uh, will refer people to watch it on YouTube. Um, I'm watching all of the, uh, the accolades coming out. No questions, just accolades. Aww. That means that, that, means that um, you explained it very well. You didn't leave anything hanging out there. So I think that was particularly good. Um, I, I also, one of the things about Nisi photography is it, it Nisi photography is a process. As much as I like to do street photography and run and gun type of photography, the one thing that I've enjoyed since I've come into the Nisi world is how it has slowed me down, allowed me to contemplate my photography a little bit more and, and put the composition together rather than um, using my natural instinct, which you know works fairly well for me. And I believe I, I told you after the um, seminar at, um, at Outsiders that what I felt was just important is not only learning how composition works, but when you have a good eye, understanding by this webinar, understanding why your good eye works why your natural instinct for uh, composition works. You know, many people get into photography because other people tell them, you take the best pictures, you take the best pictures. Boy, whenever I look at your pictures, they just look so good. And then if you get into photography, you, you get to get a deeper understanding of, of what a good image is and how to tell a story visually. Uh, but that instinct is something that until you are exposed to, you know, an explanation like you gave Sapna, you don't really understand why your pictures are good. You don't understand what you're doing naturally. So I love that about this presentation and I think you're gonna be very, very successful with it. And, um, you know, we, you know, we will, we will likely, you know, you know, ask you to do this again, you know, expand on it or go into another area of it. I know that some of our um, dealer partners will probably be presenting this as well, both on our behalf. And I know you're going to be working with B&H soon and, um, and that this will be a, a webinar with them as well. And I would very strongly uh, recommend that uh, you want that all of you look out for that because the lovely thing about a webinar is it's never the same thing twice. Something always new uh, comes up. Somebody had said color theory would be a great follow up, uh, yeah. and I agree. I agree that would be really fantastic. A little more of an explanation of um, not only, and I don't know when you put up that very complicated um, geometric form you know, pattern. Yeah, that I know. What is that called? Yeah. What is that called? 
the harmonic armature. Okay. That that's something I had never even known about before you presented it, you know, again in Utah. But you know, there's also the uh this the, the golden spiral and leading mm -hmm. lines and there's so much of this, and a lot of it goes back into fine art as well. So it is very interesting to the photographer. So I, I do see you um, here. Wow, one of the best presentations ever. Now I see why what works and what doesn't and why. I'm already thinking of images to rework. Very good. Very, very good. All I right. do have but, some uh, good news to share, Jim. I'm actually working with Adobe on... Um, developing a landscape uh, learning module. So I'll be releasing um, for the next six months or so, I will actually, the presentation I gave, I'll go in depth for each of those and create a separate chapter for each of those. And that's freely available to everyone. Um, well, then, so well, I then. think uh, that that will be a great learning resource and color theory is definitely going to be discussed in that as are you know, all the other concepts I talked about. I'll write a separate chapter for each one and release it. So that'll be available for everyone to use whenever. Yeah. Well, please share that with us. And I would encourage everyone that is uh, watching this to follow us on Nisi Optics USA, whether it's on Instagram or on Facebook or on YouTube or just you know subscribing to our newsletter. This is the kind of information we put out. And as you can see, it we're teach we're we're sharing the knowledge of photography, but we also have bills to pay. So let's do a little commercial about Nisi and uh, and Explorer. Please remember that um, in in celebration of this wonderful wonderful webinar, uh, we are offering all of you and anyone that you want to share this with a fifteen percent discount on all Nisi products from now till the end of the month. This also goes as well for our Explorer series, which is um, tripods, ball heads, lights, and different types of gear. It's a, it's a very new brand and it'll be expanding uh, tremendously over the next several years. And uh, that's a brand that we'd love you to look into. And lastly, um, Lastly, we have what I hope will be an equally fascinating webinar on Thursday with Mike Motes about um, macro photography. And I hope everyone here and more will join us for that. Sapna, if there's any closing words on your end. No, I, I think that's it. Um, just wanted to say thank you to all the people who wrote all this wonderful stuff. <laughs> thank you guys so much. It means a lot to me. It's fabulous. It's fabulous. And we will talk soon, Sapna. Uh, with that, everyone, uh, uh, I've, got my, I've got my partner in there in Sydney. Anything from you, Mr. Uh, Code? I'm going to say no. I think just if anyone had any questions they wanted to ask live, they could oh, do yeah, that now quickly. Yeah, yeah that would be good. If you want to ask a question, just feel free to pop your camera on or pop your mic on, just ask Sapna a question. It's very rare for me not to get questions, so that's interesting. <laughs> well, I will say that it's because you were very concise and very complete in your presentation. <laughs> and I, I, just, I well, there, a lot of information went out there. So I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> so, um, you know, last call for alcohol, if anyone uh, <laughs> wants to say anything now or forever hold your peace. And uh, that's it. I guess we're married. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. And we'll see you on Thursday. Sapna, please take care and uh, we'll be in touch soon. You take care. Thank you. Okay. Good night, all. <laughs>